Good evening to all on a chilly evening it is. Is this working? Can you hear or do you need it? Hmm? Okay. I would be interested to know, um, first off, how many of you heard Randall Forsberg last night? Because I will make some allusions to things that he said, and so some of you ha have, some of you haven't. Okay. We'll go from there. Forty years ago, uh, no, 44 years ago, <coughs> this coming June, um, at 6.40 a.m., Greenwich Mean Time, um, 4,000 major Navy ships and several thousand smaller vessels landed 175,000 American, British, Canadian, and other Allied troops on 50 miles of beach um, around the Normandy Peninsula. The, the landing was a success. Um, it was estimated that there would be 75 to 150,000 casualties um, on the first landing, but there were only 15,000 and there was great relief. Um, and once it was clear that the Normandy landing, the D-Day landing, the beginning of the Allied invasion of Europe, Western Europe, uh, was a success, that is to say on um, June 12th, Marshal Stalin sent a cable to Prime Minister Churchill. And he, in the cable, he said, <laughs> my colleagues and I cannot but admit, uh, admit that the history of warfare knows no other like undertaking from the point of view of its scale, its vast conception, and its masterly execution. <laughs> As is well known, Napoleon in his time failed ignominiously in his plan to force the channel. The hysterical Hitler, who boasted for two years that he would effect a forcing of the channel, was unable to make up his mind even to hint at attempting to carry out his threat. Only our allies have succeeded in realizing with honor the grandiose plan of forcing the channel. History will record this deed as an achievement of the highest order. And the same um, sentiments were expressed in the American press. That week, Life magazine had an editorial, I presume it was written by its editor-in-chief, Henry Luce, in which he said, with the establishment of a firm lodgment on the continent, we are now the most powerful nation on Earth. June 6th, 1944. Just over a year later, 1945, the Charter of the United Nations was signed in San Francisco. The signatory at the time, except the Axis powers, who were forbidden at that point um, to be members of the United Nations. They were kept out of it for several years. Up to that date, it was probably correct. Mr. Luce's judgment, I think, was probably correct that the United States was the most powerful nation on Earth. But the D-Day landings were, in fact, the beginning of the end. 51 nations signed the United Nations Charter in 1945. Today, the membership of the United Nations is 159 nations. Approximately 100 nations, now members of the United Nations, had never before in their history, before the last several decades, been nation states at all. I saw a movie recently in New York, and I commend it to you, and I think you should urge your local theater to put it on if it hasn't already appeared or isn't about to appear, and the movie is called Hope and Glory. Has anyone seen it? It's a British film. And it's the, the experience of an, of an eight-year-old boy in England um, experiencing the Battle of Britain with his family and the effect of the war on, on, on the life of that family. And um, in school, a very large, very rowdy public school, um, there is a scene of a teacher. Apparently, this is the actual experiences of the man who was the director of the film himself. Um, there, the, uh, the woman teacher is teaching this quite rowdy class who are uh, especially stirred up by the fact that there are ruined buildings on all sides of them. There are barrage balloons up. Uh, the RAF is flying overhead all the time. They're collecting shrapnel in the streets. Um, this is a suburb of London. And there's a world map. 
uh, in the front of the room, and she asks this, the class of students, the room is nearly as large as this and full, and she says, what are the pink bits on the map? And after a moment, a girl raises her hand and says, the British Empire. And the teacher beams and says, correct. She says, how much of the Earth's surface is that? And after a moment, an even more intelligent student says, two-fifths. She says, that's right. And he said, and she said, we are fighting the war to keep those two-fifths. And this is a kind of theme, and kind of ironic theme. Um, which runs through this particular movie. <coughs> the theme of the week, um, and, and as I understand it, also the theme, the theme of last year's week put on by the um, Progressive Action Coalition is nuclear madness. And I propose this evening to define nuclear madness. Um, I think that nuclear madness is an anxiety neurosis um, which is brought on by an un unsuccessful attempt to cope with world change, with rapid world change. And I think that as the peace movement, it is very important for us to see the context in which the, uh, out of which the arms race comes in, in order to deal with it. Horrendous as it is, the arms race and nuclear weapons are a symptom. Now, a symptom can be quite a deadly thing. Uh, small children run very high fevers, and this is because of a bodily mechanism that's necessary in order to fight infection, but still it can get out of hand, and you, and you very often have to treat the symptom. And that's okay as long as you understand what you're doing, as, you, as long as you understand that it's only the symptom that you're treating, and, and it is, of course, of, of urgent importance that this symptom be treated, but we are not really going to be successful, even I think, we're not really going to be successful in mobilizing the opinion that we need to mobilize if we mistake the symptom for the cause. And I, but I leave you with, but, but do not get away from the, from the importance of the symptom itself. Mr. Gorbachev said not long ago to a, to a gathering of intellectuals in, um, in the Soviet Union, he said, um, after a nuclear war, there is not going to be a bargaining table or a bargaining stump or a bargaining stone left, he, mean, he meant to say. So you know, the symptom is incredibly important, but it is a symptom, and we must understand it um, in that particular perspective. Our nuclear weapons are our equivalent of such historical artifacts as the Great Wall of China or the French Maginot Line. Or, the, or this incredible armor that, uh, uh, that uh, knights wore in the 15th century, if any of you saw the Laurence Olivier movie, Henry V, where they had, to, they had to haul them up on a derrick, these knights, in their armor to get on the horse. Um, it was so incredibly heavy, and if they once fell off, they were lost. They were stuck. There was no way they could ever get up again. Um, the, a, a, a defense which becomes a reality in itself. But it's created for very particular reasons. And the reason is a very intense, chronic, political anxiety. And neurotic anxiety symptoms are, by definition, um, not subject to reality testing. Reality testing is a way of curing the neurosis. They are an inappropriate response to the reality around. And in this case, it is my assertion that the United States, which, is the, which was the initiator and, the, and the continuing, uh, in a continuing way the sustainer of the arms race, is, um, is expressing um, an inappropriate response to world reality. Since 1945, particularly, we have been in the most rapid and most widespread period of world social change presumably that history has ever known. A hundred new nations. A map of the world that's entirely different. The map of the world that was on my high school wall was the same one that was in the, the movie Hope and Glory. And I, I remember it as being red, not pink. Most of the world was red, and that was not communist, it was British. 
Um, and this represented um, a kind of world reality that had existed since around the year 1500. A world dominated by a superpower. This was a pattern with which we have become comfortable over a period of 500 years. Whether or not we like it, we understand it, and we know how to deal with it. The great colonial power, its colonies, its dependencies, some neutrals, and the enemy. A world organized in a somewhat rational, understandable way. And so the superpowers have come and gone. Portugal, Spain, France, Great Britain, and for a quarter century or so, I would say, the United States of America. But the realities that, the realities that came to birth in 1945 have created a world in which there cannot be a dominant power anymore. Nobody calls the tune, and that's fine. That's wonderful. That's human progress. The problem is it's not yet really understood or wholly and clearly understood. Or it's understood and people are frightened. And I think we can deal with liberal politicians and with radical politicians and with conservative politicians and maybe even with reactionary politicians, but we can't deal with frightened politicians. That's bad. That's really bad because frightened people do stupid things. And there is confusion and fright if the reality with which you are brought up, the reality of your history and geography and political science textbooks, does not correspond with the reality outside. Where colonial Africa and colonial Asia no longer exist. Therefore, things have to be organized in an entirely different way. Randall Forsberg said last night that the uh, peace movement has a three-point agenda. And I think she's correct in that. Maybe that's a little patronizing. I agree with her, perhaps I should say. Um, the first is to end the arms race. Um, uh, the, the, the nuclear arms race, uh, the nuclear arms race. The second is to deal with conventional weapons. Um, and the third is uh, in intervention, intervention into um, civil wars, um, in, in the, uh, especially, especially in, the, in the developing world. Um, and the first two points, I think, are quite clear. And she gave a very fine analysis of the, the, the place we are with regard to nuclear weapons and the incredible moment that has happened. Um, I was in the, uh, a reception in Washington when Mr. Gorbachev was here, and he, had, he came uh, to that reception immediately from the White House. And he told the gathering there, he said, I said to President Reagan this afternoon, I, speaking now about the INF Treaty, he said, it's not a matter of percentages. It's a matter of a new beginning. Not percentages, but a new beginning. One of the uh, posters that Bombshot and his crew had up in the sunroom when the jazz bands were here said 2,000 down, 48,000 to go, or something like that. And that's correct, of course. And critics of the um, INF Treaty say, well, you know, this is really very small potatoes. I mean, 2,000 weapons, what's that? Uh, but the point is well taken. This is the first time. This is the first step. You, for the first time ever, we are eliminating a whole class of nuclear weapons. And the enemies of INF know exactly what that means. They have no doubt that that is the first step down a slippery road called disarmament. It actually becomes possible. And there are people in this room who have been yelling and screaming for 40 years about, about nuclear disarmament. And now, all of a sudden, it begins to happen. And historical progress is like that. You build up, and you build up, and you build up, and you build up, and then suddenly something happens, and then the rest begins to move very fast. It, it becomes a matter of catching up. Now, so the first point, there's no problem. Also about conventional weapons, and I don't think she, uh, she specifically made the point. I know that she knows it, but I would like to make the point that um, one of the objections to um, uh, eliminating or withdrawing nuclear weapons is that the Soviets, uh, it is said, have, have a, uh, a predominance of, of conventional weapons in Europe. Although, 
that is questioned, and that's questioned by major military authorities even in this country, military experts even in this country. However, um, the Soviet Union has been on record not only since Mr. Gorbachev, but even uh, Mr. Andropov, that they are prepared to negotiate, and negotiate seriously also on uh, conventional forces in Europe. And it does not, not any longer, Mr. Gorbachev says, it does not any longer have to be symmetrical cuts. That is, uh, you cut 100 tanks, we cut 100 tanks. He's acknowledging the fact that the configurations are quite different. What, what the NATO forces have and what the Warsaw Pact forces have and, and said, okay, you know, we will deal with that. And, and the evidence of the step, as, of the repeated concessions made by the Soviets on INF, I think gives us, gives us a considerable security to agree that this is likely to happen. Now, of course, none of it happens by itself. It never happens by itself you have to keep pushing all the time. And that is, of course, the sad and painful lesson of those people who are working in the peace movement or any other area um, involving social change, that uh, you can't do one thing and then go to sleep. And the, the very sorry tale of the B-1 bomber is a case in point. Uh, under pressure, Mr. Carter canceled the B-1 bomber, and then we turned around, and then the B-1 bomber was reinstituted under Mr. Mr. Reagan. So that it's, it's, it's not, it never happens by itself. But it can begin to happen. It can begin to happen now. So, now on the third point, uh, Randall Forsberg spoke about uh, intervention, and I think she's quite correct also on that point, that this is very high on the peace agenda, and there's some very interesting points to be made about this, and I want to concentrate on that for the rest of the time that I have this evening, about intervention. One point that I think she didn't make simply because she didn't have enough time is that a lot of our nuclear forces would be to are totally useless in a confrontation with the Soviet Union. When we have ICBMs that can get over there in 30 minutes, we don't need a BM bomb, uh, B-1 bomber that's going to take eight hours to fly its bomb over to the Soviet Union. And we don't need cruise missiles. And then there's, you don't hear much about it anymore, but the neutron bomb, which I'm sure is around somewhere. However, the B-1 bomber and the cruise missiles and um, the uh, and neutron uh, weapons are very, very useful in war in the developing countries. It, they fit there very nicely. A B-1 bomber is very appropriate to fly from here to Nicaragua, for instance. Okay. So the nuclear business is not I don't think it's even primarily a business between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. The weapons are in Europe. They're being withdrawn from Europe. They're being withdrawn from Europe with no major repercussions. Why? Because there are no outstanding political issues in Europe. None. There are no border disputes in Europe. The, uh, in 1975, 35 nations signed the Helsinki Accords. And the main, the main purpose of the Helsinki Accords, the reason people came together to do the Helsinki Re Accords, was because in the beginning it states that the signing parties affirm the present boundaries of the European states. Until that time, they hadn't been affirmed. There was not agreement on the present borders. In 1975, these were agreed to. There is no cause for war in Europe. It's a very different story when we are talking about the Caribbean, when we talk about the Middle East, when we talk about Northern Asia. Very different story. Here's where the issue comes, and this is where, and this is where intervention is involved. And all of this, all of this has to do with the new realities of today and the tensions and the anxieties and the fears which come out of the new realities of today. A non-colonial world, a colonial world, means a world where the uh, metropolitan power has some place to get cheap raw materials from, some place to sell some of its goods, and some place to export its capital. If you don't have those countries anymore, you have a problem if your economy is dependent on cheap raw materials, uh, a place to export your goods, and a place especially to export your capital. And these happen to be those kinds of areas where this goes on. 
in principle, in principle, and it takes a while for principle to become reality, in principle, national liberation means that the newly liberated countries, for the first time in their history, take control of their own economies. And the opening gun of that, which some of you will remember, were those lines at oil pumps in 1974 and those dread initials, OPEC, Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. <coughs> the New York Times likes to call it a cartel, very bad word, cartel. What it means is the producer countries are setting prices, the prices for their own product for the first time in modern history. The world changes. The world changes right then. Now, it's a process. There's an attempt to do it in tin. There's an attempt to do it in rubber. This is the very first attempt. The pressures on it are very great. There are many failures. OPEC's not doing too well at setting oil prices. There are many, many reasons for this. But change is happening. Major, fundamental, radical change. And the question is, and the question which is the main business of the peace movement, to put to our country to our fellow citizens in the United States of America is what are we going to do about change? And that answer is a, in literally a fateful answer. One way to deal with change is to simply try to blot out the cause. We are far enough removed that we can see that process going on with a, uh, in, uh, with a measure of balance and clarity in South Africa. We understand the change has to happen in South Africa. You can't keep a society divided into two pieces, especially uh, where the majority um, has the minority voice or almost no voice at all. We can see that, no problems. We understand what it means. If you keep that kind of change bottled up long enough, the bang will get bigger. We understand that. This, however, this is also true in a world scale, and we are involved in that. In fact, we are the primary actor in that particular scene. The role, of, the role of the foreign policy of the United States since 1945 has been primarily the role of trying to inhibit change. And that is a very dangerous thing to do. And the time now comes, the time now comes when we must say we have to be able to look at the world again and find a new way of doing things with it. Now, we have an example before us. Um, and I, by the way, I commend, I most earnestly commend to you Mr. Gorbachev's book. This is a, a unique production. The leader of the Soviet Union, for the first time in history, is addressing a letter to the people of the United States. He took his vacation. He took three months. He went to the Crimea. He worked with an English translator. And he wrote a book for Americans, explaining what he was doing and what he thought was going on explaining the changes in his own country. Um, and Mr. Gorbachev says, uh, as a kind of a summary statement um, in this book, he says, we hope that the world community will admit that nobody need be a loser, and the whole world will gain from our desire to make our country better. I heard somebody yesterday uh, say, well, it's, it's kind of Gorbachev's Mein Kampf. Well, that's OK. I, I think I, I, I will accept the comparison. What one says about Mein Kampf is that Hitler laid out what he was going to do. Well, Gorbachev lays out what he's going to do. And, he, and what he's going to do is change his country and work for world peace. Um, and if you believe him, I think that's tremendous. Now, I want, however, to use a specific example. Um, it, there are several sort of uh, catchphrases that he use, has used consistently in the, what, two and a half years that he's been the General Secretary of the Soviet Communist Party. Uh, one is openness, glasnost. Another is, is, re, is reconstruction, restructuring, uh, perestroika. Um, and the third, which is a very vague phrase in its sound, is new thinking. Now, new thinking sounds like an incredible catch-all. It can mean anything. However, Mr. Gorbachev means by new thinking something extremely specific and very important. This is new thinking about war from a Marxist perspective. Mar classical Marxism says that war is the inevitable product of class antagonisms, or on occasion of 
tensions within a class, and then they would regard the First World War as an example of that. The imperialist powers against, pitted against one another. But essentially, as long as there is class antagonism, there will be war. And a corollary of this, a post-Marx corollary in Marx's thought, was that a major war breeds revolution. And that's good. Um, and so uh, the, uh, the, uh, the French Commune came out of the, the Paris Commune came out of the Franco-Prussian War and the, and the Soviet state came out of the First World War. And this was elaborated, this particular aspect of the Marxist doctrine of war was elaborated particularly by Mao Zedong, uh, who felt that the, the, the result, the, the, the consequence, or used to feel, uh, that the uh, consequence of a, of a third world war would be world socialism. And therefore, the famous phrase, the, nucle the, uh, uh, the atomic bomb is a paper tiger, meaning that it is not ultimately destructive but creative of the new. Now, Mr. Gorbachev says, sorry, we were wrong. That's not the way it is. This is new thinking. And he says specifically, um, but now, with the emergence of weapons of mass, that is universal destruction, there appeared an objective limit for class confrontation in the international arena. The threat of universal destruction for the first time ever there emerged a real, not speculative and remote, common human interest to save humanity from disaster. Said, there, said we drew the conclusion that there is a, the disappearance of the cause and effect relationship between war and revolution. Economic, political, and ideological competition between capitalist and socialist countries is inevitable. However, it can and must be kept within a framework of peaceful competition which necessarily envisions cooperation. It is up to history to judge the merits of each particular system. It will sort out everything. Let every nation decide which system and which ideology is better. Let this be decided by peaceful competition. Let each system prove its ability to meet man's needs and interests, and so on. OK, so he's made a proposal. He said, war doesn't work, and nuclear war is out of the question. And therefore, he has proposed um, a nuclear-free world by the year 2000, 13 years to go. <coughs> Uh, and on the, what, the 21st of this month, Mr. Sh Mr. Shevardnadze and Mr. Schultz will meet in Moscow to discuss the first steps of convening a conference on, of, of, of uh, preparing an, an actual agreement on um, intercontinental missiles. The peace movement has a job of changing minds. Not of selling a bill of goods to the people, talking about a hypothetical possibility down the road or an ideal way of doing things, wouldn't it be nice if we did things this way or that way? The peace movement has to say, look out the window. Look at the world as it really is, a world in change, a world in change for the better and a world which is waiting for this country to help lead the change, or a benign movement toward fullness of life for all people. There are not a lot of issues. There's just, there is one big overriding issue. That's one thing I think is, is so, uh, well thought out um, as, the, uh, as the program of the uh, uh, Progressive Action Coalition, where it includes concerns about Central America, about Southern Africa, about the Middle East, about peace, about domestic problems, because they are all part of one problem. And all of these are instances and consequences of a world in change. 
And for all of these, the question is, how are you going to face change? And change, historical change, is always painful. It's always scary, and it always produces symptoms, and a lot of these symptoms are not nice at all. Every time there is a threat of major change, there is hysteria of one form or another, and there is usually brutality and persecution. Every time the world begins to reshape itself, there, there uh, are all kinds of witch hunts, there is anti-Semitism, there is racism. It comes along. It's a neurotic symptom. You can almost tell that something's about to happen. They burned witches in the 13th century and they burned witches in the 17th century in Massachusetts. There were anti-Semitic outbreaks during the Crusades. Um, anti-Semitic outbreaks at the height of nationalism in Europe. There is racism now in this country relating to economic change, relating to social change, expressing anxiety. And not only is it destructive of life and the well-being of a lot of people, but it also is the futile and self-defeating way of refusing to face what's happening out there. That's why the peace movement is so incredibly hopeful, is such, is such an incredibly healthy thing. How it is a part of the whole pattern. Ecology is there too. Um, and, and all the range of social and economic change which are before us and all the incredible possibilities that are before us. And so we lament. We lament that it is probable that the U.S. relative standard of living of the 1950s will never be achieved again, relative, relative to the rest of the world. Others began to catch up after that point. True. But, uh, and it's like people lamenting the end of the old south, gone with the winds. But we give little to get a lot. We give a little bit for a more human world where we can become human beings. Um, I read the, uh, the fascinating narrative of the ex-slave Frederick Douglass. Uh, he, was, um, he was a slave in Maryland. And he uh, was adopted as a house slave by a family, a, a young married couple who had never had slaves before. And he records how the woman in the family became a slave owner. By virtue of having him as her slave, she became a different person a different human being. She adopted different values, a different style of life. We are a colonial people. We are a people who live by virtue of colonialism and it stunts us that we live in this way. That our wages are high and our, and our um, purchases are cheap because they come out of the sweatshops of Singapore and South Korea and Hong Kong and Taiwan and New York City when they, uh, with the illegal immigrants and, and um, uh, Los Angeles and Texas and other parts of the world. We are less as a result of this. And the peace movement says there is a better world. It's right here. And the only thing we have to do is not close the door to make it impossible. We've got to remove the symptoms. The symptoms do incredible things. None of us in this room, I presume, has ever been literally physically touched by radiation, but everybody in this room has been touched by nuclear weapons, by the fallout from nuclear weapons. Uh, to give three examples, and then I will stop. Um, a country which has had to cut back and cut back and cut back its social services and its education for the military budget. And we, and we are paying and we will go on paying. We have a whole underclass now. Uh, which is a result of, of uh, the budgetary constrictions laid down by military spending and, and they are going to be around for a long time and we will have to deal with that, that reality. Um, we are touched by military spending because we now live in a national security state. To a large extent, our Bill of Rights is a, is, is a museum piece in many respects. In a way, I feel slightly sorry for Colonel North. He was brought up in the ethic of the national security state and they caught him at it. This is the ethic that was taught by, the, by a number of presidents of the United States, lived out by them, by virtue of this unspeakable secret which we are hiding in our bosom, which is nuclear weapons. We have created a society of a kind that's never existed before. By the end of the century, one out of every six 
people or the families of, of one of these people in the United States will have a security clearance. Will have a security clearance. That means we are uh, bonded servants to the government, restricted in what we can do. This is what's happened to the freedom of the American people by virtue of nuclear weapons. And finally, we have created a generation that not only doubts its own immortality, a generation which doesn't expect to live very long. And the aimlessness of the, the, of the contemporaries of my sons, and they express it that way, uh, is directly attributed to the fact that they don't really expect that having gone to school, they're, ever going, they're going to be doing anything more than for about another 10 years. In the history of the world, there has never been a moment like this. Now, there were times when people thought the world was coming to an end the year 1000, the year 1843, and again the year 1844, but that was good. That meant that the hoped for paradise was on the way. What the world had been planned for from the beginning was reaching its culmination, and God was going to make everything right. What these people are saying is, it's all going to stop. It's all going to stop. Nothing that anybody did mattered. This is what nuclear weapons have done to us, and they're just a symptom. They're just a symptom of the real neurosis, the real anxiety, that we don't want the world to, to be any different than it was yesterday. It's scary. The world is a scary place. And unless we're prepared to accept that scariness, to see the nations of the world, the developing nations, the socialist bloc of nations, the neutral nations as fellow strugglers towards something much better, which we will all share, then we are a menace to the whole world. The uh, writers of the gospel claim that uh, Jesus uttered one of these very baffling, very irritated sayings when he said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. I think the meek are the clear-minded, the unpretentious, those without anxiety or defensiveness, and they inherit the earth because it's theirs because they are the ones for whom the earth was made and they're the ones that will take care of it, regard it as more precious than their fears, more precious than their preconceptions, more precious than their ideologies. Until we see the peace movement in this world perspective, where we are partners with the Soviet Union, with developing countries, with the neutral countries, with the socialist countries, with Western Europe and the tremendous peace movements of those countries and where it's going, we are not going to really contribute, and this is where it has to happen. It has to be here that the United States will move, that the people of the United States will move their Congress, that they will move their administration, and they will say, yes, we join the world, and this the incredible world consensus that says nuclear weapons must go, intervention must go, conventional weapons must be vastly scaled down because the human race is ready to move forward, and we can be part of that. Thank you. Thank you.